I do want to just acknowledge a few folks. One, I certainly want to thank the Center for Global Health here and Heather, um, who I've been knowing for a few years, and it's just exciting to be back. My colleague, Paula May, who is, um, I trained with actually at MGH, is here, and she works for SEED as one of our clinical directors for internal medicine. Um, so she's, again, she's a gastroenterologist by training. And then Dr. Perrin Cobb, who recently just left MGH and now has come to USC. Our hearts are broken back home, but you guys have gotten a great, great doctor and human being to help lead the critical care efforts here. And so I'm very excited because I think we're going to hopefully build some work together here, um, which will be, uh, I think, the beginning of some really great, uh, great stuff. So thank you for joining us all. Um, so we're going to go through uh, various, there's sort of chapters to this talk. Then we're going to start with just some basics of global health, I think just to talk about the tangled web of global health a little bit, the space that we're trying to work in. We're going to talk about a single problem in global health that SEED is trying to work on, which is human resources. We're going to talk about the program itself, and then we're going to talk about what we've learned in the first two years and what this looks like in practice, um, as well as exploring some of the opportunities ahead. So, how many people here feel like they could define global health? Hands. Anyone feel like they could give a really succinct definition? So I've asked this question many, many times, and I will tell you I've had maybe two hands in five years of asking that question. And one hand that I did get, I thought actually sums it up, which is, well, it's about everyone and everything. And I was like, actually, that kind of does sum it up. Because it's not succinct. And I think that that's the really important thing to realize about global health, because there is room for engineers, there's room for architects, there's room for artists who might use therapy. One of my board members actually does Art a Bach, and she brings it to areas that have been affected, a health, effect, health crisis areas that children can have a form of trauma and healing, or healing from trauma through art. Um, one, and it's really, global health has got a funny history. It's rooted in tropical health which was back in the colonial days, companies from Europe were going to Africa, primarily West Africa, and they were trying to, they were doing business, extracting rubber and minerals and all these things, and their workers kept getting sick. And they didn't want their workers to get sick and die, so they started to send doctors to try to keep people healthy, and that was tropical health. Tropical health then sort of evolved in international health, which was this idea of, well, people in other countries get sick and they're poor, and we should help them, and this is international health. And then folks sort of realized, you know, it's not that clean, is it? Because SARS virus gets on an airplane and can leave China and come to the US. Or, God knows, Ebola goes to Dallas, right? So I mean, people, there was a realization that you couldn't box global health into an us versus them, but that it actually exists very much in, in many different forms and crosses territories. And I think if we're really honest, global health is local health, right? Consider your community and the people you're treating. Consider in the United States the number of population that are uninsured, at risk, or don't have access to health care. Think of the Indian reservations, the you know, Native American reservations in this country. It's pretty profound, actually, when we consider what global health can be. One of the most comprehensive definitions, though, that I have seen is, was in The Lancet in 2009 that really did look at global health um, specifically and sort of tried to define it as a number of parameters. And you'll see this is a really comprehensive definition that I don't think I, I, you know, I won't read out, but it's the idea that it's transnational and across its borders. It's a scope of problems, not necessarily just geography. That importantly, it embraces the entire health system. So it's from prevention all the way through to treatment and care and also support. And so, you know, this is probably the most comprehensive definition that I've seen, but as you can tell, it's not succinct in any way, shape, or form. It's very large and embracing. So there's a very disproportionate burden of healthcare in the world. About 97% of the world's global burden of HIV is actually uh, in the world's poorest countries. And it is, so it's clustered into countries that have the lowest GDP and the least access to healthcare. Equally, non-communicable diseases, so there's a rising shift of non-communicable diseases are happening in the world now, and 80% of those diseases now are basically based in all low and middle income countries. So the largest burden of disease is again in countries that aren't necessarily the best equipped to address it. Most shocking, 99% of maternal mortality uh, is actually occurring in resource limited countries. And that is a very shocking number when you think about the fact that there are 
many opportunities, I think, that we could be doing a better job in those numbers. But this disproportionate burden of disease is really important to be considering when we think about how we're going to tackle some of these problems. If you look at the global burden of disease, you look at actual mortality, there's big differences in various areas of the world. So if you look at low-income countries, that has a very different sort of uh, hierarchy of what diseases affect them most. And if you look at them, a lot of those are infectious diseases or preventable causes of death, right? Things that we have tackled better in middle and high-income countries than we're doing in low-income countries. And that really speaks to some of the conditions in these countries, the social determinants of health that drive some of these differences. And so when we start to talk about global health, we can't just think about flying in and doing surgery and fixing something. We have to be thinking about all the issues and all the kind of context that go into creating some of these health differences. Social determinants of health, are the, there's many that you want to consider. There's certainly the biological and your genetics and what you're born into. There's socioeconomics, so there's a famous paper that came out in the 70s in England that looked by the quintile class, economic class, uh, called the Whitehall paper, that looked at the quintiles of economics um, in the country and basically found that if you were poor, you had a much higher relative risk of mortality compared to somebody who was wealthy. You see that certainly playing out in the international sphere. There's environmental risks, so do you live next to a waste plant? Do you live next to uh, you know, dumping ground? Do you have access to clean water? Um, what are your exposures? Are you going to be exposed constantly to hurricanes or typhoons where you're losing you know, some of your resources? And individual behaviors make a big difference as well. You know, are you putting yourself at risk? Are you using condoms? But all of these things go into health. But there aren't just the social determinants of health, there's a lot of actors in health as well, right? So this sort of maps out some of the actors we want to think about. There's the state, so there's the US government, or the Norwegian government, or there's the government of Kenya that are all playing a role in health. You have civil society and organizations that might be advocating for health. Um, you have market forces, right? So pharma, I'm going to price my drugs at a certain price, and you can't actually access that price point, so you can't access our drugs. But it's not quite that clean, right? Because you've got the Gates Foundation. It's a little bit of a market force. Bill Gates made all of his money off of computers. But he's using the money that he made to actually drive certain um, movements in health. And so there's an element of civil society there as well. You've got things like the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria that lies a little bit between state and civil society or um, in the sense that, well, I guess they, they, this map isn't listed there, but I personally would it listed there, in that you have a bunch of countries that are giving money to the Global Fund. I guess it falls under market as well, because you have, a, you have a bunch of countries that are giving money to the Global Fund, and the Global Fund suddenly use that money to create a market pool to buy access to drugs and ARVs that can help drive down price point. So you have this mixture of actors, and so you have to be contending with all these different forces. There are key stakeholders in the actors that everyone should be aware of if you're engaging in global health. You've got multilateral international organizations that we just, like an example of the Global Fund that we just discussed. You have the UN agencies that bring together countries to try to drive policy. You have um, countries themselves. The US is one of the largest donors in global health, but the Norwegians are putting huge amounts of money into internal health right now and are really starting to drive that agenda. You obviously have the partner, the, what we call partner countries, which are the countries themselves that are driving, you know, the health issues. So you've got a country like Tanzania that has two or three doctors for every hundred thousand people, has one woman die every hour from a problem, in, you know, from complication of pregnancy or childbirth. That country is really, you know, that's the country, if you will, that's at the pinnacle of all of this because it's their people, a population of 44 million, that they're trying to answer the questions for. But you have all this, you have some of these, and then in private sector, you've got businesses and foundations and academia, and you've got a USC, a UCLA, and MGH that are starting to partner with institutions. You have civil society and NGOs like SEED, um, and certainly you have individuals. Bill Gates is an individual who has put billions of dollars into global health and has influenced that sphere immensely. I wanted to talk a little bit about the U.S. government in global health because we should be thinking about the country that we work in and what the global health sphere is. So I did an exercise where I mapped out all the agencies in the U.S. government that do global health to try to get an understanding of how our government alone works because we are a single entity on those bigger maps, but it turns out we have a lot of entities in and of ourselves. 
So this is the State Department that you're looking at. These are all, these are actually not all, these are sampling of, of the offices in the State Department that do global health. You have USAID, you have the Millennium Challenge Corporation, you have the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator, or PEPFAR, that's put billion dollars. You have the Department of Defense that has its own section in global health. But then you have the Department of Health and Human Services, which has the CDC, it has NIH, which is doing a lot of research, it has its Office of Global Health Administration. So it's got a whole group that's going on. The White House itself is the National Security Council that worries about global health. Ebola went under the, uh, you know, the National Security Council, the NSC. That became sort of Ebola, you know, that's where Ebola was dealt with. You have the Peace Corps, where about 80% of their activities has some realm of health. They would say about 60% is purely health uh, related. But a huge amount is being done in health in the Peace Corps. And then you have these efforts that link the two. So you've got MEPI, the Medical Education Partnership Initiative and the Nursing Education Partnership Initiative that links NIH and PEPFAR. PEPFAR funds, NIH implements. So it starts to get complicated. It gets worse because then there's our legislation, which actually has the <laughs> Senate and the House Foreign Relations Committee that are making decisions about policies and appropriations, but you have the actual appropriations committee that say, yes, actually, you get the money to fund all your work. So it's not so easy, even just within our own government. We have global financing, so you've got the providers of money, you've got the folks that are actually managing the money, and then you have the folks that are actually spending the money. So, on top of this though, there's also shifts in how we're funding. So what you're looking here is a 2010 Lancet article by Chris Murray that looked at funding sources. And he looked at funding sources, and if you look at the rise, look at that rise of the orange and the yellow. That is more private entities like the Global Fund or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So the private money that is coming into the system that is starting to increasingly affect global health. You still in the purple and the blue zone have a lot of uh, bilaterals, meaning governments themselves, the Norwegians, the Swedes, the US that are giving huge sums of money. But that orange and yellow is really starting to rise and then you're seeing increased private investment that's going to start affecting global health. And I think you're only going to see that continue to rise in future years because governments are not going to be able to put in enough money to solve the problems. And as the private sector starts to get involved, either because they're benevolent and they want to actually fix something or because they want to access markets, you're going to start to see that money change. This looks at channels of assistance, so it's just how that money actually, what kind of avenues it goes through. So the Swedish government might give money, but they might give money to the the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria, which is your yellow. Um, and so you're, again, you're starting to see these multinational and private channels are rising as sources of way that funding is going. So as I've laid out what the atmosphere of global health is, sort of what the context is in which we're working, we're trying to solve problems. And in, with those partners, in that environment, in that context, and as we try to solve those partners, uh, try to solve problems, we want to ask ourselves sort of, you know, what are the problems we need to be solving? For a long time, the movement in global health was, we're going to focus on HIV AIDS, we're going to focus on malaria, we're going to focus just on women and children. And Seed would argue that we've missed an opportunity. That the problem we should actually be looking at is people. Human resources for health. That people are ultimately going to be at the leading edge of any problem we solve. And that if we have well-trained people, we can actually save lives better, and we can better integrate all of these different silos of health. The World Health Organization in their issues an annual report every year. In 2006, they did their World Health Report on, on uh, the workforce. And this chart is very simple. It basically says that the more health workers you have, that's your x-axis, the more lives you save, your y-axis. It is a simple concept. But it took sort of seeing this graph for people to say, oh my god, maybe we should start focusing on people. And so people, so the same report pointed out exactly how problematic this was, though, that there were critical shortages. And there's actually an updated report that came out in 2013. And I, it didn't collate the data this neatly, so I need to actually go through and comb through, like, by country where the shortage is. But it hasn't changed that much that the 2006 data gives you the point that these shortages actually are, that there are critical shortages of doctors and nurses. In fact, there's a critical shortage of 7.2 million skilled health professionals globally. And that we would need to be training many, many more, up to 12 million to be able to meet these deficits that we're gonna to continue to see in the, over the next 30 years. And so, 
recognizing that, the realization was that these shortages aren't actually global. The shortages are concentrated in certain parts of the world. And that turns out that where those shortages are, are actually very problematic. Because if you look at a place like Africa, Africa has 25% of the global burden of disease, so a quarter of the world's burden of disease, but it has 80%, basically, of the shortage of healthcare workers with which to address that disease. And so the actual healthcare workforce globally, if you took the, the full workforce, is 3% of the global workforce is based in Africa for 25% of the global burden of disease, which is incredible. The mismatch is massive. The maldistribution of these shortages can be, you can map it geographically. And as you can see, this is actually the top 57 countries with critical shortages. You can see it's only really in certain areas of the world. Turns out there's a reason for this. There's geographic shifts of healthcare workers that have happened over time. So Fitzmullen, who's a senior advisor at SEED, did a study in 2005, printed New England Journal, that looked at emigration rates and found that of places where doctors and nurses from other countries want to go, they want to go to the US, they want to go to Canada, they want to go to the UK, and they want to go to Australia. But where are they coming from? The top three places were the Philippines, India, and Pakistan. So you looked at the rate of immigration, but it turns out of the top 20 countries that have the highest rates of immigration, nine actually come from sub-Saharan Africa. This looks a lot like that map that we just looked at. So people are leaving the places where the critical shortages are worse. And there are reasons for that. Something drives the brain drain. And brain drain is driven by the fact that salaries aren't high enough and paid, your children may not have schools to go to, so you don't want to stay and work there. It may be conflict in your country. It may be a lack of resources. And research has been done to really investigate why people want to emigrate from their country and leave. And it turns out one of the biggest drivers of people leaving is lack of professional development inability to practice what you trained in, and inability to continue to learn going forward so that you never feel like you're up to date and you're not able to take care of patients well. There's also a phenomenon called internal brain drain, which is that NGOs go into countries and they hire these doctors and nurses to work for them to help implement their programs. The salaries are steady, there's benefits, families get taken care of, and I'm not actually calling anybody out on this, and as you can see, I include ourselves in this. It's more to represent that there's a phenomenon of NGOs that go in incredibly well-intentioned, but that are also participating in siphoning off the public sector system. What has happened in recent years is there's been a leadership gap as well. So a lot of money has gone into increasing frontline providers, community health workers, and increasing you know, these, the, the points of access to health care. And as that money has gone into the system, the number of community health workers has risen. In some cases, the number of nurses has increased. Some doctors maybe have increased. But what has not increased at the same rate has been the leadership, the kind of the faculty that are actually capable of not only providing excellent care, but are capable of teaching and training others. So as we've been expanding this frontline healthcare workforce, we've been neglecting the pipeline and really thinking about who is going to continue to nurture this pipeline going forward. There was a study also done by Fitzmullen that looked at the, all the medical schools in sub-Saharan Africa and found that the 198 medical schools, over 100, was missing up to half its faculty. It's impossible to teach if you don't have enough people to be able to teach. This leadership gap can be reflected also through a mapping exercise that a colleague did of mine. So this data comes from 2007, where a colleague of mine at Mass General typed in the word HIV to PubMed which is our medical search uh, engine, and basically looked at the first 300 articles that showed up in PubMed and found that of the first 300 articles, he looked at the first author of every article and mapped their home institution and found that 37% were based in North America. This is HIV, where 75% of the global burden of disease is in Sub-Saharan Africa. 37% were based in North America, 21% were based in Europe and only 7% of the first authors were based in Sub-Saharan Africa, where indeed the global burden of HIV is highest. And that mismatch, I think, really reflects the lack of sort of intellectual training um, and the loss of faculty in that part of the world because they should be driving the questions. They understand the context of what it means to be affected by HIV. And so this critically important mismatch is something that we realize has been growing. There's also a gap in specialty training. 
So we know that the majority of diseases now that are starting to affect the world are non-communicable diseases. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death globally and is now actually in sub-Saharan Africa. Malignancy is number three. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and chronic pulmonary diseases across the board is number five. So this shift of non-communicable disease is starting to grasp many parts of the world totally by surprise. Because there are depth to te at, at treating HIV and TB and these infectious diseases that we rarely see here. But the non-communicable disease phenomenon needs to be addressed, especially as it's rising. And so this need for specialists is only growing. Specialist, though, in many countries means even just a pediatrician, an obstetrician, a surgeon, or, you know, very basic. It doesn't even mean cardiology or endocrinology or something that, that specific. And if you look at South Sudan, South Sudan is a medical journal. It is young, but it has a medical journal. They printed an article where they note that there are 500 physicians in the country and none of them are specialists. That means they completed medical school, they did a single house officer year, and they've been unleashed to provide care. That means there's no trained obstetricians, there's no trained pediatricians, no internal medicine doctors, none of that in the country. And that to be able to train those folks, they have to go externally, and it could cost up to $25,000 a year to train somebody. They estimate they could train three people for that same amount of money at home if they could just get a system up in place. The power of these specialists should not be underestimated. I'll give the example of an OB. If you have an OBGYN, that OBGYN can train a skilled birth attendant to address signs of labor and help somebody through a simple labor. They can train a midwife to maybe deal with some premature birth or breech birth or you know, some basics of, of more complicated uh, childbirth. Or you can train another OBGYN who can deal with ruptured uterus, peripheral sepsis, um, uh, you know, hemorrhage, and other big problems. And importantly, that same person can again continue to train across the health spectrum going forward. So there's a really powerful position to training this highly skilled healthcare worker that has been neglected. So it was with this idea that we started Seed Global Health. And I want to back up a little bit to talk about sort of how we came about the idea, or specifically how I sort of stumbled into this work and this idea, and that um, was able to join a lot of other smart folks who were thinking about the same problem. So in 1991, I got to go to Vietnam with my father. And I had spent, a, I'd had a chance, both my parents were in public service in this country, and I'd had a chance to see poverty here, but what I saw in Vietnam was unprecedented. I mean, clothes were torn, people had no shoes, there was no running water, there was no electricity, people lived in houses with no doors, no windows, corrugated tin roofs, there was trash right outside in the, you know, in the canals behind their house. There was... It just, there was no hospitals, there was no stores. It was, for a 14 year old, it was really shocking to kind of see this t totally different level of intense poverty. I didn't really know what to do with it when I was 14, but it, it just stuck with me. And so when I started to realize I wanted to go to medicine, go to medical school, I realized I needed to somehow bring that experience with Vietnam in. And I ended up taking a job in Ghana in 2002 to implement, to look at a study of vaccination and vaccination completion rates. And this was another eye-opener into the degree of poverty and lack of resources in a different part of the world that, again, I didn't quite know how to reconcile, but I realized that there was a growing, there was something that needed to be done about this. And so throughout this time, I started to do my training. I went to medical school. I trained at Mass General. I did my residency there. I ended up doing my fellowship there. And I got a chance to spend time working in Rwanda and Uganda, you know, throughout my medical school and my training. And this just reinforced for me the realization that there was incredibly intense needs. So this picture is a picture of me delivering a baby in Rwanda as a fourth year medical student. I had no right, no authority, and no training to be doing that. And I have to say I was absolutely terrified. I was unfortunately the only option for that woman. And the baby got stuck, and I had no idea what I was doing, and I looked at the nurse and I asked her for help, and she looked at me and she said, you're the doctor, and I'm thinking, I wasn't a doctor at this point, but she looked at me and said, you're the doctor, and I realized that there was such a hierarchical divide that even though she had 20 years of experience delivering babies, she was gonna defer to me on what I thought was the right thing to do. And what this did for me was realize that there was not enough, this was clearly the moment of there's something fundamentally wrong here. There's an intense need for more doctors and nurses. There's an intense need for people to be well-trained. There's an intense need to break down some of the hierarchy of professionalism, and somehow this needs to change. 
And what I, the picture on the right is that there is that was a maternity ward in Uganda where you can see people are sleeping on the floor because there's just not enough resources to take care of people. And again, there's a single nurse basically taking care of that entire ward and not enough doctors. And so, if you looked at sort of history, there, there, we had there were lessons to be learned about incentivizing of, of sort of how we could maybe start to fix this problem. There was an intense need. There's an intense interest, and there's a need to be training and teaching and actually getting out there and trying to solve these world's problems, trying to solve the global health problem a little bit around training people. Cuba, it turns out, had actually been doing this. So Cuba has about six doctors for every thousand people in the world. And with that number, they've actually sent out thousands of doctors and nurses for years to be mostly doctors abroad to be training. It's their whole idea of international diplomacy, that they're going to send these doctors to be Cuban diplomats to train and treat people, and importantly, to provide some lessons. And so a study was, and this was based on the Cuban Revolution, which happened in 1959, which is the idea that health is a human right, and was one of the most fundamental and critical investments you could make. And if we were going to do it for our country, we should do it for other countries. And it was part of their way of spreading the, you know, the messages of communism, but this was the idea that they did. And so this actually got studied from November 1999 to February 2004, and in that time period, the Cuban doctors had done over 400,000 deliveries. They did 12 million health promotion activities, and they did almost a million trainings and teaching and courses to personnel over that time. So there was a precedent for this in the world that um, was starting to take hold. At the same time, we realized that for folks to be able to get engaged in service in this country, we weren't going to mandate it the way they did in Cuba, but we might need to incentivize it. And a big issue for people here is loans, because it turns out that it costs $170,000 to $200,000 to get a medical education in this country. And so to pay back that debt, it's very difficult to get engaged in service. But there are programs in this country that incentivize people to be engaged in service. There's the National Health Service Corps, which for two years of service in an underserved area, you can get loan repayment. But there's a state level, West Virginia did this to incentivize people to work in underserved areas in West Virginia. And Harvard Medical School actually has a program of loan repayment if you get engaged in um, service or you commit to public service, they'll help pay back your loans. And so realizing this, we sort of said, you know, maybe we could create this for international service. Maybe we could fill that demand with interested and people here who really want to be engaged, we can support them with service by helping to pay back their loans. And the bonus is, why don't we get the US government to do this? Because we really believe there should be a face of diplomacy of US government that should be doing this. And we thought, it would be great. We'll get the US government to do it. We'll high five them, and they can take it over. And we'll just take off and leave, and we've done our job. It wasn't quite that simple. Because we were trying to figure out where in government we could make this work. And there's there been many attempts to legislate for it before, and we'll talk about that history in a moment. But what there hadn't been, we, but we were sort of trying to figure out the home for it. And we started to decide that maybe the Peace Corps was the place. And this was based on the idea that in 1960, President Kennedy spoke impromptu on the steps of the University of Michigan at 2 in the morning and asked the question, who of you are willing to be the doctors who are going to spend your days in Ghana? And that was among the other questions. This was the beginning of his movement, ask not what you can do, you know, your country can do for you, what you can do for your country. And it's this idea that young Americans could actually go out and be diplomats for the country. So we thought maybe the Peace Corps really was the home, because there started, there'd been attempts to think about this problem before. How could you send US physicians and nurses to teach and to train and to fill in this niche? And so there's a report that came out on the heels of PEPFAR's big push to put HIV medications into the field back in 2005. And so $15 billion have been put towards purchasing HIV medications. And the thought was, well, how are we going to actually teach people to give those medications? And a big report came out at the time and said, well, why don't we send Americans abroad to be those teachers and trainers? It never got off the ground because people said the model was too expensive. They also were asking for legislation. And this was a bill that was introduced in the Senate to try to get this core out there. Nobody was willing to legislate for it. And we realized that in today's Congress, you were never going to be able to legislate for it. So we said, well, let's just start simple. Let's start a grassroots movement. We started to write about it. We published in the New England Journal. We published in the New York Times. We said, we're going to find a way to start this conversation with the government. We're not going to legislate for it. We're going to find an agency. We think the Peace Force is the right one. 
we got really lucky because a colleague of mine discovered that there were three former Peace Corps directors and the then current director at the time, Aaron Williams, were going to be speaking at a forum in Boston. And we went to this forum and we just raised our hand at the end of it and we asked a simple question, what do you think of the Peace Corps sending doctors and nurses abroad to be educators? You know, not just to provide care and leave, but to actually train, teach, transfer skills and to help the Peace Corps have a more technical body to it. And three former directors that had no skin in the game were all like, great idea, no problem. And I always tease the then current director because he paused as though he knew this was a premonition of what was to come. And he said, it's a great idea. And so we just elbowed our way to the front of the room. And we said, great, when can we come to Washington and meet you and make this happen? And he's sort of like, okay. But he, to his credit, he said, let's find a time. And we went down to DC and that was the birth of this program. And he was willing to sort of advocate that this should go through and should go through the Peace Corps. We got lucky though, because this all was happening in 2010, right after the reauthorization of PEPFAR, which was the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which put originally $15 billion into HIV care, and now is about to put in another $48 billion into this whole effort. And they realized, though, to grow and scale this program, they needed to train 140,000 healthcare workers. And suddenly, our program was looking pretty good as an avenue to try to do that. So it's a little bit right place and right time. To echo that, US development aid at the time was starting to focus on people. It was the one area of aid that had basically doubled was in terms of investing in people. So we knew we had an opportunity to be able to really argue that the US government should be, making, should be investing in this money investing money in this program. So in 2012, we officially launched in March of 2012 what we called the Global Health Service Partnership. And what this was, was a public-private partnership with the Peace Corps and Seed Global Health to send doctors and nurses abroad to educate, to teach and to train. And we were funded by PEPFAR for three years of funding to be able to make this program happen. Our volunteers were sworn in at the White House in July of 2013. The first class went out, uh, inaugural class, and they went to three countries, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, this is our inaugural class that went out, and they were brave souls, because we said to them, you're gonna help us build this airplane while we fly it, and your input is gonna be critically important to us to make this happen. The Peace Corps changed, created a whole program and branch, and Seed Global Health joined. And the way the model works is that it is a true public-private partnership, where you go, will serve as a Peace Corps volunteer, as clinical faculty for at least one year, we're very much in partnership with host institutions, so we need host institutions to be able to guide us on what specialties they want, what kind of, and, and to really embrace these folks and bring them in as faculty. The idea is to enhance clinical training. So you might be teaching in the classroom, but the whole goal is to enhance what the actual patient care looks like on the wards through better clinical mentorship and training in that level. And it's something that nobody else is doing. So yes, health prevention is important, but we're talking about what it means to actually treat that patient in heart failure, to actually take care of that patient with appendicitis, and to actually be able to take care of that patient you know, who's having sepsis and you want to get the antibiotics appropriately. The volunteers must be fully trained doctors, so at least board eligible or board certified, and the nurses have to have a considerable amount of clinical experience. And we look for folks who have teaching experience. And what makes us different from basically any other program out there is the idea that one doctor or nurse will train 10, who will each go on to train 10 more and so on. So that there's what we call a force multiplier or exponential effect to this teaching and training, which we think is critically important. And it's really kind of a dorky version of online dating that we do. So what happens is that uh, we, the site tells us what they need in terms of um, a doctor or cardiologist like Steven. They basically, we recruit heavily to try to find these individuals. We will uh, interview them, we check their credentials, and then we will place them at the site. The site will review their CV, and then off they go for a year. The Peace Corps, they serve as Peace Corps volunteers. They get a living allowance from the Peace Corps, which is not a lot of cash. It's about $4,000 a year on average, but it's enough to live, eat, and be like your counterparts. You get your travel paid for, you get medical benefits, you get your um, malpractice covered, your housing is covered. And then what Seed Global Health provides is all the technical, medical, and nursing expertise for the selection, placement, recruitment, and support of these volunteers while they're in the field for the selection of the sites. 
We um, try to complement programs through grants and, and you know, bringing in resources that are needed. And then we provide loan repayments like them. So you're actually eligible to get up to $30,000 a year of loan repayment for each year served. We also cover debt, educational debt, but we'll cover mortgages as well because we recognize that older folks who may be at the sunset of their career wouldn't be able to serve unless they had their mortgages covered. The program thrives on partnership though because we rely very much on the Peace Corps to actually help deploy these individuals. SEED provides the technical advice and the loan repayment. We rely on the host institutions to help us tell the priorities. We are PEPFAR funded. Uh, we rely on academic medical centers for their expertise and innovation and example. And then of course the volunteers themselves are really responsible for the energy. There's a lot of opportunities here for academic partnerships that we're trying to build on. Um, MGH Global Health is our founding partner and they do provide some resources, but we're looking for other opportunities like creating a sabbatical core where an institution might say, we're going to send one of our doctors or nurses to go for a year, we'll hold their job for them, and we'll support them for the year that they're going. Creating a fellowship model where people might spend, get credit for being in a fellowship and working with our program. And certainly uh, faculty job sharing is another big one, or departmental exchanges is the other opportunity. Um, what does this look like in practice? So in our first year, we sent 30 physicians to these three countries, Malawi, Tanzania, and Uganda. We stayed in those three countries in our second year. Uh, the statistics you see are really, the, these are the numbers of doctors and nurses that are in um, the, you know, per population of 100,000 in the three countries. In the U.S., we have about 250 doctors and about 950 nurses for the same population, just to give you some reference of how sparse these numbers are. Uh, we go to, we've gone to multiple sites in each of the three countries. This is year one. Um, in year two, we switched two sites in Tanzania uh, and added two additional sites. We actually kept those original two sites that you saw and added two sites. So we ended up actually losing two sites in our third year with the realization that our two sites that we started with, um, basically two of these sites weren't putting any skin in the game. They weren't introducing our faculty, they weren't really performing. 30 volunteers in our first two years have sent, um, does it want to now move? Okay, we've taught about 2,500 doctors and nurses in our, 2,800 doctors, nurses, and skilled health professionals in our first year of 30 volunteers. 42 volunteers went on to train 2,500 doctors and nurses. We've taught over 180 um, different courses, skills, or new procedures and teaching modalities in our first year. And we have gone on to teach over 80,000 service hours of work in just these years. We've sent over 100 volunteers to these three countries. So this program in its very beginning has already had a really large impact. We consider these outputs. The real thing that we have to look at is whether we are able to actually retain folks. If we bring people into the public sector system, can we keep them there? Um, which is critically important for us to ask. We have some signs that maybe we're having that effect. And what I want to be sensitive to time and what I wanted to really end with were stories. So one story that tells me that we're having some impact on retention was a guy named Matt Robinson, who spent a year working in northern Uganda in an area that was completely conflict-ridden. When Matt left, he was told that he and his other colleagues who worked in the Department of Internal Medicine had reduced mortality on the wards, which was the first time they'd seen that kind of impact. And further, he found out that five graduating students asked to stay on as house officers in this northern Ugandan hospital which was incredibly significant and had not happened before. Most people would flee to the capital before that. So some signs that we're gonna have an impact on retention, some signs that we're impacting mortality, and our job is gonna to be to study that. We have another volunteer named Maureen, who's actually our clinical officer of OB. Maureen spent her time in northern Tanzania. Within six hours of being at her site, Maureen was told to come to the operating theater, the operating room emergently, and there she had a pregnant woman on the table who was dying. And she realized that she couldn't save the mother, and she tried to save the babies, and she couldn't save the babies, and she was very devastated by this. She'd literally been there six hours. But the next day, it happened again, and Maureen got called to the emergency room, into the operating room. She went running, and she realized she couldn't save the baby. The baby had died. It was, fortunately, a very difficult ruptured uterus. But she was determined to save the mother's life, and she did. She performed a life-saving procedure that saved the mom's life. This was a mother of five children. 
who she would now be able to go to home to, which meant not only that woman's life is saved, but that those five children's lives were likely improved because we know that children who lose their mother are more likely to be socially disadvantaged and economically disadvantaged over their lifetime. But she also changed the care in the region because Maureen taught all of her counterparts how to perform the same life-saving procedure. So in a country where one woman dies every hour from a complication of pregnancy or childbirth, Maureen helped transform the care that would be available to these women. Maureen also taught 45 labor and delivery nurses how to the most recent updated protocols of labor and delivery. And about a week later, some of the doctors from the district came and said, when did you come to the district and teach? And Maureen said, I didn't. And they said, well, then why do all of our labor and delivery nurses know the updated protocols? And it turns out the 45 nurses she taught had all gone out and taught their peers. So there was a ripple effect horizontally that happened as well. And so this is just sort of one example of the impact that we know that we're having. A third is in nursing. We had a nurse named Kelly Lippi who worked in southwestern Uganda. She had 160 nursing students when she started her class. Only two actually wanted to be nurses. 158 were nurses because they didn't get into vet school, they didn't get into pharmacy school, and they didn't get into medical school. Kelly was determined to change their outlook because she wanted them to realize that as nurses they could be completely empowered to care for their patients well and to take care of their patients and be their advocates. And she spent the year teaching her nursing students what they could do to help their patients, even if their patients were going to die, to die with dignity, to die without pain, and to be advocates for them. And when she did her year-end review, all of her nurses wrote essentially the same message, which is, you've made me so proud to be in this profession, and you've made me think I've chosen the best profession in the world. And many of them wrote to say they couldn't wait to teach their own students. And that is the, that same sense of pride. That's exactly what SEED is about. We are trying to plant the seeds of global health. That is what the name is, so that we are not only having an effect across the health spectrum horizontally, but we're going to have an effect across generations to increase the quality and breadth of education and to hopefully have this force multiplying impact. And to be able to create a movement of realizing that people are at the front line of being able to make changes in global health and that we have to be focusing on the health system broadly if we're going to start to see the changes that we need. Um, so thank you very much for your patience with the technological and for uh, your help for coming and joining and listening today. I really appreciate it.